Welcome to the Lunch Hour Legal Marketing Podcast. And Guy, I'm going to start this with the exhortation to all of our listeners to not start a podcast. Do you want to know why? No, I don't. You want? <laughs> what are we doing right now? Let me, let me guess this. What percentage of podcasts fail within the first year? I mean, 99.999 repeating. It's 82%. What's fail, by the way? Oh, fair, fair question. 82% of podcasts do not have a episode within the past three months. So they so, just stop, they, they die. They die, they die, they, they just give up. Now here's my question. Yeah. What percentage of podcasts meet their initial objective? Well, <laughs> less than 82%. <laughs> right. <laughs> No, I think, you know, think about like, why would you even start a podcast? Why does anybody start a podcast? Why do we have a podcast? Well, I think that I we think have nothing the, else to do. The concept of podcast is great, right? And, and I think as we learn to consume media in different ways, you know, there's video and there's written and there's blogging and there's podcasts and there's TikTok and there's all sorts of different ways that we consume media. It's a good thing. The problem is, from my perspective, twofold. One, there's lots of them. And it's not like people are growing more ears or commuting more or the podcast hour listenership while growing is not growing as fast as the number of podcasts. And two, quite frankly, this is the same problem that blogs have. It's legal. There are not that many people that want to listen to a podcast about the top 10 things to do when you get rear-ended on your motor scooter, right? Yeah, that's a particularly bad example, but I hear your point. <laughs> You know, I say podcast if you want a podcast, but if somebody told you you're going to podcast your way to millions, that's where, to me, the problem lies. <laughs> Zero to, wait, we keep coming back to this. <laughs> Zero to seven figures in three easy steps in two months. Podcast your way to the top of the Google rankings. Well, so, I mean, here's the thing. Yeah. Oh, do you want to go? You want to go there? <laughs> nope. Hit the rundown. Yeah, you do. No, I'm not. No, you can't. You, you tease me again, Guy. <laughs> so, by the way, Podcasting is super successful, right? But it is a lot of work. And I think many of you do not realize the work that goes behind the shiny thing. So I did actually, I, I was instigated by a blog post that I read somewhere that talked about the links that you can put in a podcast, which I'm not quite, the all the SEO upside of putting links in your podcast. Just think that through for a little bit. And if you can't understand why that's ridiculous, also don't start a podcast. Go read Mockingbird Marketing blog on podcasts. Well, no, no, no. So the, what I really want to say is if you do want to do a podcast, our awesome audio producer, Adam Lockwood, who is sitting in with this recording session right now, did me a huge favor and wrote a long post on how to do it right, how to get the audio right, and all the work that goes into making that happen. So if you're serious about it, get serious, but you will not podcast your way to millions. What else are we going to talk about today besides <laughs> podcasts? Today on the docket, as always, is news. We're going to go over reviews. We're going to do a small, short class on my favorite TLA, three-letter acronyms. Guy is also going to offend all of our state bars and get us uninvited to all speaking engagements in the future with a new segment we call Dear State Bar Regulator. And with that, let's hit some music. And welcome to Lunch Hour Legal Marketing, teaching you how to promote, market, and make fat stacks for your legal practice, here on Legal Talk Network. Welcome to Lunch Hour Legal Marketing. Before we get started, we want to thank our sponsors, Lawya. Alert Communications, Lexus Nexus Interaction, and Clio. All right, on to the news. In MA activity, <laughs> Litify bought Legal Stratus. So, this was an interesting thing. Litify, which is does intake management software, has now purchased what to me has been an unknown key head. Have you ever heard of Legal Stratus? I had not until I saw on LinkedIn that lit if I bought them. Yeah, likewise, at, at which point I looked them up and I was like, oh, it's a matter management software. 
My point here is there's integration between intake management and matter management, and that is sorely missed and needed, even if the Litify acquisition is from, and I'm probably going to, here we go, offending people again. We're probably going to offend people, but i never heard of legal stratus, but integration. Clio bought what was called Lexicata, which now became Clio Grow. Like the, you will see more and more integration here. It just makes sense from a software perspective. Well, you know what? You know why it makes sense? It makes sense from a client journey perspective, right? 100%. You, you start out, you get into the pipeline, and then you get moved to a client, and then you get moved in even beyond that. So, um, Are you carrying the client flag again? I'm try. Okay. Poor clients. You get, you get a job with it. In other news... Just south of Michigan, state bar regulators have banned competitive brand bidding in the PPC markets. Guy, good or bad? Well, it's, it's, <laughs> if you actually read it, Eric Goldman, a professor uh, at SCU Law, who has a great blog, by the way, if you search Eric Goldman's blog, writes about the intersection of technology, advertising, amongst other things. But the analysis is like, it just is another, you know, when we get into Deer State Bar Regulator, it's just a demonstration of like, they're catching up. So the short version is, in Ohio, you cannot bid on your competitor's name. Here's the problem. You might not even bid on your competitor's name, and you might still show up for a search on your competitor's name because Google does things like close variance and there's all sorts of matching things. And so, you know, my view of the competitive bidding, let's just let's just take the ethics out of it for a second and think about it. One is, and I'd love to hear your feedback on this. I think it's pretty rare that you actually get a great return out of a competitive bidding situation. I think so. I'd like to see your numbers on that if you I know you're making a face at me. But the other thing too is there is reputation and relationship damage that is done in your local community bidding on competitors' names, especially if you're in a small community. That's the thing that people don't think about. It's like, if you become the lawyer who's dealing on the competition's name, are you actually jeopardizing relationships with people that might otherwise refer you business? That's my question. Okay, first thing I wanna unpack a little bit is you said close variance, yeah. right? And I'm gonna mm-hmm. unpack what that means because I think it's important. Google has started to realize that some brand names mean personal injury lawyer, for example. And so they confuse effectively a search for personal injury lawyer or Morgan and Morgan with the other thing, which means depending on how you have your campaign set up, you can unintentionally be bidding on these brand names, which we have seen a lot. I think that is a that's the most it, common example of it. it it's a right? very common example. And the that. lawyers all think, oh my gosh, they're bidding on my name. And it's like and then they no, get mad. they're not. Right. right. And so what do you, so from a pure pragmatic perspective, what are you going to do? Walk over to the state bar regulator and demand access to someone else's Google ads account to see whether or not this close variance concept is being implemented, which is why they're bit, like, no. Well, you could subpoena them if you want to get serious about it. The other, the other thing, the other example that was brought up to me was is like, oh, well, you know how you solve that? You just add all of those <laughs> brand keywords as negatives. <laughs> Yes. So just take your whole lawyers, the state bar directory Go. for your state and put all the lawyers' names as negatives in your campaign. And all the brands of their law firms. Right. right? Don't forget about the trade names. Yes. And their 800 numbers that they're advertising on television. Yeah. Right. So I would be more than happy to take your money on an hourly rate bill. That Let me give list. you the counterpoint that I think you might, uh, this might actually might resonate with you is, is that I've always looked at this like, if you're not misleading the consumer, right? Let's assume that I'm not bidding on Morgan and Morgan and then saying in my ad copy, I'm actually Morgan and Morgan and then they're calling me. That's obviously false and misleading and the FTC probably wants to get involved in that. It'd be no different than if, you know, Nike was like bidding on Adidas and being like, yeah, this but is an Adidas is, ad. It is different because everyone knows Nike and everyone knows Adidas. But not but everybody th- knows Morgan and Morgan? Well, no, but like not everyone knows Smith and Jones who might be bidding on Morgan and Morgan, right? Like I don't think you're necessarily dealing with a, an industry that has kind of that widespread brand recognition. There's lots of little players and I've said this for a long time. Very few people outside of the legal industry have much brand awareness outside of heavily advertised PR markets of lawyer brands. And so therefore, I think there is an argument to be made that there is brand confusion on this, right? I think there is brand confusion on this. 
or they're so let, me, let, let me give you yeah. this one. I'm bidding on Morgan and Morgan, and my ad says not Morgan and Morgan. Well, your ad can't say that because you can't say Morgan and Morgan, but you could right. say um, consider so let, let the me, alternative. Don't go with them. Go with us. Yeah. Great. Game on. Right. Or like, so let me take Morgan and Morgan, for example. Let me ask you this question. Morgan and Morgan has the, I am not loving this, a la McDonald's, as we're talking about brands, size matters, right? Like, I'm not sure I would have leaned into that as my catchphrase, but it's certainly memorable. Could you have an ad playing off the size matter? Bigger isn't always better, right? I can see a very clever ad playing off bigger not being better. That's not misleading. Do you think firms should still be able to do that? Yeah, I, th I actually do from in a purely philosophical sense. I mean, I think that it actually is better for the consumer to give them options to be able to say, you know, for, let's forget about the reputational aspect. Let's forget about the relationships. Let's forget about the misleading part. Let's just say, is it good for the potential clients, for the legal services consumer, for lawyers to be able to compete on brand and I think the answer is yes, because more options to be able to say like this lawyer is three hundred dollars an hour, and I, I can do the same thing. That, you know, in theory. And this is another. I think one of the major issues that lawyers don't like about this, and state bar regulators don't like about it. And we'll talk about this more when we get to my letter on to state bar regulators. Is you know, lawyers are special. They're not widgets. It's a profession, and so like in a perfect world, the regulators want potential clients to be making this hiring decision based on purely objective criteria that's very difficult to quantify, right? Because, you know, lawyer services aren't fungible. And so that's where I think the problem, really, that's the root of the issue. And so they're saying, you know, it's it's not, you know, it's not fair because you know, there was actually a case in uh, Goldman's uh, article talks a lot about this because there's a bunch of different bases you might bring a complaint against somebody for doing this, you know, whether it's... Uh, I'm blanking on what all the different words are. We went gone a lot deeper on this than I thought we were. We going went wait. So we went. So I actually like when the news turns into banter between you and I about <laughs> philosophical. And Guy always, Guy has painted me as a bit of the villain in terms of teasing and poking other agencies. Guy, I've figured your motif out. It is the consumer advocate. It's a very, <laughs> Google, it's a very Google specific uh, perspective. Well, but th this is the thing. The whole point of all of this regulation is supposed right. to be to protect the consumers. It's supposed to be able to protect the consumer who gets misled, or it's not supposed to protect the guild. Right. It's not supposed to protect the lawyer's guild. The point of these legal ethics rules are not to make things, you know, protect the lawyers. Okay. Sorry. It's my diatribe. That was... Our longest news segment tangent. That was long. Man, we don't have any time to talk about anything else. Next we're, time. We're, we're going we're to talk right back about this in Dear State Bar Regulator. However, right now, we're going to talk about some reviews. Leave us a review. Pull over right now. Are you listening to this while you're driving? Pull your car over and leave us a review. If you can't stand me being a consumer advocate and beating up on the state bars or Conrad Schilling for Google, go leave us a review. So this goes back into why it's hard to start a podcast. Because these algorithms, the things that make more people likely to listen to you, you guys think it's hard to get reviews for your law firm? Now you have to get reviews for your law firm and your podcast, right? Your multi and your podcast about car accidents. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so this is hard, but go, leave us a review. And also we should thank Louisiana State Bar for sharing our, our episodes here right before Guy sends his state bar regulator letter on, on this episode. But yeah, it'll help us find more people just like you. Let's take a break. The right client relationship management solution enables and empowers firm growth. LexisNexis Interaction is designed specifically for law firms and embeds client intelligence at the heart of every interaction providing valuable insights into client relationships so you can make strategic decisions about how to focus your resources to gain more business. Learn more and request your free demo at interaction.com slash lunch hour. No one cites routine drafting as the reason they chose to become a lawyer, but that's where a lot of time goes for solo practitioners and small firms. Lawya can help you transform your existing Word documents into reusable templates with no coding required. Save time and avoid errors with intuitive features like conditional logic. Use a tool that empowers your experience and expertise. Learn more at lawyaw.com. That's L A W 
www.yaw.com. Okay, class, welcome to LHLM 101. Today's topic, advertising alphabet soup. Please have a seat. Let's get started. Conrad, don't eat that. (laughs) Today, we are talking about advertising alphabet soup. I'm Professor Gee, along with Professor Conrad. Conrad, when we say advertising alphabet soup, what in the heck are we talking about? So... Today's class, we're going to cover what are typically known as TLAs or three-letter acronyms. This specific subject matter we're going to be talking about is different ways of buying advertising, okay? And so there are different models of these. They all fall into a three-letter acronym. So we're going to talk about CPC, CPM, CPL, CPA, what all these different things mean. So, have you ever... (laughs) CPC is also frequently called PPC, different paying models, pay-per-click or cost-per-click. The reason I like PPC over CPC is because every now and then, have you ever had someone ask you about pay-per-clip advertising? Pay-per-clip advertising. It hasn't happened for a long time, but um, sometimes- That's a great idea for a brand name for a (laughs) search company. Pay-per-clip marketing. Yes. So can we walk through these different models, Guy? Cost-per-click- Cost per click, CPM, CPL, and CPA. You know what's interesting about all these? The first C is the same for all of them. They could just be two-letter acronyms, which in which case my three-letter acronym TLA would still work, except it wouldn't be as ironic. <laughs> Let's start with CPC. What's CPC, Conrad? Professor Conrad. So CPC stands for cost per click or pay per click, not pay per clip. And this is a situation in which you basically pay every time someone clicks on that advertisement. There are other ways that the clicks can actually be counted, right? You may click something to view a phone number, but ultimately you're only paying when someone actually clicks on that advertisement. Made famous by our good friends at Google with the Google Ads platform. Correct. CPM gets a little bit more confusing and there's a little bit more math involved. Guy, what is a cost per thousand? Yeah, cost per thousand, which I was actually going to ask you. Yeah. Is the M is Latin for? Yeah, it's the Roman Roman numeral for a thousand. The Roman numeral for a thousand. Thank you. CPM, you pay per thousand impressions. So you get a thousand impressions, you pay a cost. Typically done with display or video advertising. And one of the keys here that I think is important to note is with CPM advertising, those impressions can, and not all impressions, this is the Animal Farm or 1984 version of online advertising, not all impressions are created equal. And there has been lots of ways that publishers have hidden impressions or overcounted impressions. And I will give you a couple of them. One is how much of the ad actually loads right? And so is it all of the ad? Is it part of the ad? If you're looking at a video, do you have to see the whole thing? What does that look like? So actually the percentage of the ad that actually shows is is a question. Where the ad shows on the page is also a question. So one of the ways that publishers stuff ads into content without ruining the user experience is to stuff all those ads at the very bottom of a page that no one ever looks at. The final thing, and Gee, I don't know if you've ever run into this, but I have recently. This is called ad stacking, mm-hmm. where you can load a thousand ads literally on top of each other. And That's so nasty. It is nasty. It's super nasty. I don't want to scare people away from this type of advertising. I do, however, want to reinforce the need to make sure that you have good reporting in place to determine whether or not it is worth your time. So, you know, the stacking problem is basically, I'm going to sell this one piece of inventory on a web page to a thousand different advertisers, and I'm going to report to all of them that we loaded their content, but they're just one on top of the other, like a deck of cards. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, you know, you talked about reporting, but like you got to understand campaign objectives because if you're running CPM and you run up impressions, I don't even, you know, what, how do you do attribution there, Conrad? 
<laughs> you want to get it? You, we've got our basic one-on-one course, and you want to go into yeah, multi-channel attribution modeling? Right. No, no, yeah, you next. can't. You can't see. You keep teasing the audience, and then you push me into these things. So I'll answer your question. So let me restate the question, and then I will answer it with my philosophy on how this works. Multi-touch attribution modeling basically says there are multiple marketing channels that are going to impact whether or not someone eventually connects and, and, and becomes a client of my law firm. So for example, you do an SEO query, you land on a page, you get retargeting display advertisements. Maybe later on you see an ad about uh, a video ad on YouTube. You run another click, you click on a Google ads, and eventually you call and turn into a client. Maybe you get a newsletter reminder, et cetera, blah, 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 blah. So, you're, so our simplistic attribution modeling used to look like either first or last touch. The first time someone came to your site or the first time we could start tracking that person got all of the credit, or you have last touch, which is the last time, the last channel. Clearly, it's philosophical and doesn't really work. There are lots of different attribution modelings. One of the most common is 40, 20, 40, where you give 40% of the value to the first touch, 40% of the value to the last touch, and then anything in the middle you split among 20%. All of these are theoretical machinations that don't really make sense because they don't really have a deep understanding. My honest answer to your question, very long-winded answer to your very simple question, Guy, is at the end of the day, when you're dealing with a multi-touch attribution modeling situation, you add everything up, you divide, and that's your cost per client, right? Because it's so hard to use these theoretical models to accurately allocate what that looks like. Right. Especially when you're talking about brand, because- Yes. Right? Oh, how did you find us? Which I know you hate that, but let's just say that you're asking that question. How did you find us? Oh, I just, I, I don't know. I heard your name somewhere, right? Was that because you got shown 5,000 impressions of a display ad? Or was it because something else? Yeah. Anyway. All right, moving on. Moving back. So that was a teaser for next year's class. Marketing 201. <laughs> yeah, that's like 401. That was, uh, yeah. It would be if we if we the did graduate it experience. Okay, so let's go back. So CPL cost per lead has recently come on the scene in the digital marketing space with what key LSAs, another <laughs> another <acronym>. TLA, <laughs> another LSAs, a new TLA. <laughs> okay, what is CPL cost per lead? How does this work with the TLA framework? So you just pay. You don't pay for a click. You don't pay for an impression. You pay when someone actually contacts you. And ideally, if you even you want to throw a Q in there, CPQL, cost oh. per qualified lead. Oh, you want to go there? Okay, I good. Do. What do you mean by cost per qualified lead? Well, you know, if you're running, say you're running an LSA and someone, you're a personal injury lawyer and someone contacts you for bankruptcy help, you might go to Google and say, that's not a qualified lead. And so I want a refund or dispute it. And will Google give you that refund? You know, they've actually been pretty good from my experience so far. It's still early and we'll see how that all scales. But, you know, the, the tricky ones become like if you only check like catastrophic injury and that's like, well, you know, if they're technically hurt. You know, you can't really dispute those. But if it's literally like cross practice areas, you check just the car accident box and people start coming asking you for divorce help. They'll give you a refund for those. Okay. So cost per lead, cost per qualified lead. We're, as a precursor, we're going to come back to cost per qualified lead a little bit further. Let me ask another question, Socratically, because I know mm -hmm. the answer. What if I never talk to that person and they just leave a voicemail in Google local service ads? Am I still paying for that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, baby. <laughs> oh, yeah. So word to the wise, thou had better have a very good intake experience while you're running those ads. And if you're not Thou'll going best. to- that, that. <laughs> Okay, the last one, CPA. Is this a certified public accountant key? Yes. No, it is cost per acquisition. All right, so when we talk about cost per acquisition, what do we mean here? Well, I'll tell you what I mean. You might mean something different. Mm. I mean cost per client. Okay. What do you mean? So I think one of the ways that CPA is often used poorly, in the, especially for legal, is on the cost per action. 
where you're trying right. to get someone to do something. Right. Cost right? per download. <laughs> cost per download. You can even do like a cost per, like you could be running all sorts of things, but like only pay for when people call you. Right. And so you're trying to get people to do something, whatever that action might be. The problem, as Guy highlighted, is that thing rarely is, especially in an online reporting system, it rarely is someone signed up for my service, right? Someone signed up for my legal service. If I'm trying to sell them calculators or to sign up for a legal marketing conference where they're, that, that final acquisition can be tracked online, CPA can actually be really helpful. Yet most of you do not have the infrastructure to report back to that actual acquisition into your reporting infrastructure, right? And so by and large, I find while much of the advertising industry embraces cost per action because it takes all of the risk away, in our case with cost per acquisition, there are very few publishers who work on a CPA model because it is so hard, A, to track, and B, to actually quantify how valuable that end client is. Yeah, and that's, and that's what my thing is, is like no matter how you're paying for your ads, you should always be doing a CPA analysis on the back end, right? Because I don't care if you're doing a Google Ads campaign, you know, hitting a target cost per click is meaningless. Oh yeah, you know, when you hear this with agencies, oh, we brought your cost per click down. Oh, oh it thanks. drives me crazy. It, that drives me nuts. But, oh, man. Okay, sorry. You should going. see Conrad. His head literally just exploded. <laughs> can you talk about why that's so stupid, and then I'll anecdote this for you? Well, I can't even think of why that's even a thing. I mean, you know, I guess in theory, you're like, you got more, if clicks were lumber, you know, you got more clicks for a lower cost. I guess that's a good thing. The rising but price you, of lumber. You can pay half as much for a click and have you know, half the acquisition and double the acquisition cost. And it's like, what was the point of that? True and very recent anecdote. We have a client for whom we've been working for for a while. And I will be blunt, we have struggled with success for this client. And Guy, I've brought you in to look at this client. You know who I'm talking about. We've brought in a bunch of different people to look at their work. And, and it's in a very competitive market. And I will be blunt, we have struggled. We brought in another agency to look at some of their stuff and they wanted to look at the CPC work. So we, we handed the, the reins over to the other agency to run CPC for a while and see what happened. And their entire focus was on dropping cost per click. What the hell are you guys doing? Like, if you're trying to get personal injury cases with a cost per click under 10 bucks, like, just, what are you doing? Like, what? why do you, it's just insane. So this is why, Many of you, especially the agencies who don't work in legal, are focused on the exact wrong thing. Sorry, that just that just hit a nerve because I, I literally we had this conversation it's like a fresh two wound. weeks ago. Fresh, fresh wound. wound. Cost per click, terrible metric to determine whether or not this is working. Right. Anyway, whether the reason we talk about this stuff yeah. is this is what's out there for ad buying. You Got to understand what it is before you start spending money. But at the end of the day, you know what we should have talked about was another acronym called. ROAS, but you got to start, you got to think about what the meaningful metrics are that's, for the ways that's that you're 201. buying. 201, next time. I, I So I'll tell you this, even before you get into return on ad spend and above those metrics that we just talked about, he mentioned cost per qualified lead, which is really important and it is coming into play in the, in the local service ad game. However, I think all of you should be angling towards evaluating your advertising spend cost per initial consultation, right? What happens after that initial consultation? What happens before that initial consultation? There's a lot of variability within there. But if you're looking at cost per initial consultation by marketing channel, and you have the infrastructure to comprehensively look at all of your inbounds and track all of your inbounds down to that initial consultation, that's where like if you can just focus your brain on that as opposed to like CPC rates or bounce rates or any other garbage like that, that's where you start making good decisions. And next, the Legal Trends Report brought to you by Clio. All right, Guy, did you know 42% of solo law firms operate without 
commercial office space. In fact, 9% of solo firms gave up their commercial office space in the last year. Surprisingly low number to me, Guy. Um, I, yeah, I, I hear that. You know, we're talking solos. I think that's important. But yeah, gosh, it's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out. And tying in, so one of the data points that we've talked about a lot is revenue, profitability. Solo law firms making 50 grand more in revenue than other law firms on a per lawyer basis. As you embrace technology, right? You can cut your office overhead. You can dump your lease. Dump your lease, make more money, right? Like, it's very simple math. Right. Well, and I think the other one, this is not, I, I think another interesting thing that we're going to see, because it's not just, you know, I'm, I always think maybe naively that the market drives so much of this, but the question is going to be, do clients care? Do clients care? Do they want to see you, you know, in certain contexts, or are they fine with being on Zoom? Because here's the thing. We know that if you're using technology, especially technology that enables you to service clients remotely, you can grow the proximity of where you serve clients, right? So, you know, if you advertise like, hey, you don't need to come in, you can grow the radius around wherever you are. In fact, you can be anywhere and serve clients. I, I know uh, Lee Rosen talks about this. He's all over the world serving clients, you know, for his client base, doesn't matter. I'm going to be curious to see in certain contexts whether clients are like, I want to meet you at your office. And what do you do? Oh, I don't have an office. See you on Zoom. So George Saharis talked about this at our last right. Go listen to the last episode. Call. Go listen to the last episode with George because it was really good. And one of the things that he does a very good job of verbalizing was the different needs for different clients and at different points in your cycle. And, I, and what I want to emphasize here is there are some times when technology can be super helpful and for some clients where it's super helpful. And there are other times where, and I think George said this really well, people just want to spill their guts in person, right? And so part of this is reading the clients like, yes, technology makes it easy for us to have Zoom meetings or for us to record podcasts in three different states, like very easy. Sometimes, especially with that empathy, the need for legal empathy, there is an in-person element to this. And do they want to spill their guts at Starbucks? Because that's the best option you've got if you don't have an <laughs> office, right? <laughs> right. Let's get a very quiet corner of Starbucks to talk don't about No one listen to us. Yeah. We're talking about confidential things. <laughs> We're talking about your marriage falling apart in Starbucks. Okay. To learn more about these opportunities and much more for free, Download Clio's Legal Trends Report for solo law firms at clio.com slash solo. That's Clio spelled C-L-I-O. Let's go to break. As the largest legal-only call center in the U.S., Alert Communications helps law firms and legal marketing agencies with new client intake. Alert captures and responds to all leads 24-7, 365 as an extension of your firm in both English and Spanish. Alert uses proven intake methods, customizing responses as needed, which earns the trust of clients and improves client retention. To find out how Alert can help your law office, call 866-827-5568 or visit alertcommunications.com forward slash LTN. And we're back with a new segment that we're calling Dear State Bar Regulator. Dear State Bar Regulator, I appreciate that it's a difficult job to navigate all of these new technologies in the context of lawyering in general, but more specifically advertising and marketing. But it's time to catch up. And I know that this is not going to make us friends. And as Conrad mentioned in the outset, we will no longer be invited to speak at state bar conventions. Like, for example, dear Texas, do I really still need to print out every single one of my web pages and ads and social media posts to send to you for pre-approval? Like, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to, like, save it as a draft first? Am I supposed to save my Twitter post as a draft and then send it to you if I'm making a communication about legal services? Dear Florida, am I really not supposed to appeal to the emotions of my audience because otherwise that's by definition misleading or manipulative? Dear South Carolina, 
I can claim my Google My Business profile, and I can even ask my happy clients to go say something nice about me there. But if they say something nice and it violates other state bar rules, I'm responsible for the content of their review, and I don't have the ability to remove it? Dear state bar regulators, please help our poor legal profession sort out these issues and many, many others by fixing some of these rules or revisiting them or something. Help us. Help us. Help us help you help us. Help the lawyers. So, I mean, the help us thing is really interesting, Guy, because we're dealing with a handicapping of lawyers when the legal industry is Let me actually, let me be careful when I say the legal industry. Be careful. Lawyers are increasingly competing with non-lawyers within the legal industry, and yet they are being held to a higher standard than their competition. Great. Here's an easy example. For those of you who are getting all the gobbledygook and are bored with all the ethics stuff, here's the example. (laughs) You're in South Carolina. You claim your Google My Business profile. Your client says... Conrad was the best lawyer. He's the best lawyer I've ever seen. Oh, I, actually, I don't even know if South Carolina, if you can use best as a superlative. Let's just say well, you as can't. a client, I can say that. Not if the lawyer, and in South Carolina, if the lawyer told you to go do that. This is, my, this is your point exactly, right? And then, now let's also say, but guess who can be in South Carolina and say, best wills attorneys he found here in their title tags, LegalZoom, Avo, Lawyers.com, everybody over at um, Internet Brands. They can all use the superlative. They can use the superlative in their H1s and title tags to grab that juicy SEO query for best wills and estates attorney in South Carolina. Right? Right. And then, and you know, I I guess the segment's turning more into a rant than anything else. I want it to be constructive. You know, I get asked, what should I do? I'm in South Carolina. What should I do? Not claim my Google My Business listing? Does that seem realistic and fair? It's a huge competitive disadvantage. You know, put a disclaimer up. Hey, we don't actually solicit people. If you see reviews here, we didn't actually ask anybody to do that. Or, and you know what my advice is? Challenge the rule in the Supreme Court. I just can't believe this is constitutional. We need to get Josh King on here. We can get, he's now in Arizona. Oh, they got some fun rules too. So I will, let me channel my, my inner Josh King. Josh King would say, Sue the state bars, which is what he did lots of, for the right to talk about how great you are, which is going to further disenchant the uh, state bar regulators with the Conrad and Guy show. However, at some point, this competitive disadvantage is something that the lawyers are not going to be able to stand for. Right. Well, how about this? What is the intersection of non-lawyer owned law firms and these state bar advertising Speaking of Arizona. Rules. Right. That's gonna be, I mean, and again, I, you know, look, we're all very concerned for the legal services consumers. They're going to be misled in their great time of need and duress by these very sophisticated, savvy lawyer advertisers who are, and then you go and you ask, well, like, you know, how many, complaints have been filed by a legal services consumer because they felt that they were unduly manipulated by an emotional ad. That is a very good test, right? I, so as you were talking, I was thinking, I was going to say, dear state bar regulator, consumers aren't as stupid as you think they are. And then I was like, ah, <laughs> uh, uh, maybe, may, maybe that's not actually accurate. But your point is actually really Valid, poignant, important. The complaints that state bars receive from people regarding the marketing superlatives that are used by lawyers compared to the other complaints that the state bar regulators have received about lawyers, 99 to 1, 100 to 1, Right. Like, I just can't imagine that the state bars are overwhelmed with complaints about the marketing of lawyers, not well, the legal you know profession, where that but one, of lawyers. You know where the one complaint comes from? Lawyers. Right. <laughs> the competition, right? I'm going to take their ads down, get their co- account suspended. Yeah. It's either lawyers or lawyers acting through consumers, right? 
If this doesn't get us a negative review on Apple Podcasts, I don't know what will. <laughs> Dear State Bar Regulator, please do not review Lunch Hour Legal Marketing please on do. Apple Podcasts. Please Actually, do. you know what's interesting? It would be very, we'd have to find the right person. It would be very interesting to have a conversation around these issues with someone, say, from Florida. Yes, the author of the handbook on lawyer advertising for the State Bar of Florida, please contact us. I, I don't think Not with a cease and desist. I don't think they, that's going <laughs> to Volunteering to be a guest. <laughs> and with that, we thank you listeners, as always, even you State Bar regulators who are listening. Please do go follow us, like us, subscribe to us, whatever you can do to- Review us. Review us. Send us a message. And hashtag us at LHLM on the various socials. Until next time, this is Professor Conrad and Student Gee with Lunch Hour Legal Marketing. Thank you for listening to Lunch Hour Legal Marketing. If you'd like more information about what you heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via Apple Podcasts and RSS. Follow Legal Talk Network on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And or download the free app from Legal Talk Network in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, or subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer. Do 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 do. So what you what you what you want?